Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Essential Fish Habitat Coordination and Consultation Guidance Webinar. We're really excited to be here today um, in a collaborative format with National Marine Fisheries, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as well as some of our Stantec partners to um, walk through some project examples with you. Um, we recognize that Essential Fish Habitat is one of those um, resources that sometimes um, gets a little bit uh, confused with um, endangered species. And so we thought that this would be a really great opportunity to walk um, you guys through a little bit of background on the essential fish habitat and kind of walk through some project examples and talk about um, these resources in, in depth. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, our speakers today. Um, I'm Katasha Cornwell. I'm with the Department of Transportation Office of Environmental Management. But like I said, we have a collaborative um, format today with um, both Dave Brideen and Jen Scholl with National Marine Fisheries here with us and Andy Kozlowskis from the Army Corps of Engineers. And so um, lots of really great expertise here. Um, Dave Brideen, he's one of the biologists at National Marine Fisheries Services in the Southeast Regional Offices Habitat Conservation Division. He's one of the DOT Environmental Technical Advisory Team members, or ETAP members. Um, he works on both essential fish habitat and endangered species. And he serves districts one, two, three, and seven for projects on the Gulf Coast of Florida. He's worked in his current position at National Marine Fisheries um, for 16 years. And before that, he had extensive experience as an estuarine and coral reef field ecologist. He's worked on an EIS for the generic EFH amendments for the Gulf of Mexico and the US Caribbean Fisheries and Management Councils. He holds an undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Rhode Island and a master's and PhD in marine biology from the Florida Institute of Technology. So we're really excited to have Dave here with us. Um, I had a chance to work with him a lot when I was in District 7. So um, we also have Jen Scholl, like I said, she is another one of our um, fisheries biologists from National Marine Fisheries in the Southeast Regional Habitat Conservation Division as well. She um, is our ETAP member for both EFH and ESA, uh, I think they're the only two had National Marine Fisheries who do both, um, for districts two, four, five, and six on the Atlantic side. She's been in her current role for four years, but she's worked at National Marine Fisheries Services for over 20 years and has extensive experience as a coral reef biologist and a science program manager. And um, she has experience in strategic um, planning and communication with regard to science. She also holds an undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Miami in Marine Affairs. And like I said, we have Andy Kozlowskis here today as well to help us understand how EFH um, fits into the environmental permitting side of the, um, the, this equation. And um, he is the chief of the Panama City section of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville at the District Regulatory um, Office. He oversees the Army Corps uh, DOT ETAT staff, currently consisting of five positions funded through the Water Resources Development Act. His team provides ETDM reviews, he, they serve as ETAT liaisons, they evaluate permits for our projects. He's worked at the Corps for 12 of his 18 environmental regulatory career, and he has earned a marine um, biology degree from the University of West Florida. So again, as you can see, lots of really great experience. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, in terms of what we're gonna be doing today, we really have an in-depth conversation to um, have Dave Rydine really introduce us to what essential fish habitat is, talk a little bit again about the differences between essential fish habitat and endangered species. Uh, we're really gonna focus on essential fish habitat, but you'll see endangered species kind of tied into some of the project examples we go through today, because we really wanna highlight the differences between those two resources and how that they should be, um, there's two separate consultation processes and that their documentation of the results of that consultation is different for each of those as well. Um, but again, we're gonna be here for a couple hours. We are gonna be recording this training, so if you wanna go back and use it as a resource, or if you um, have a you know coworker who wasn't able to attend today, we can share that out. It might be next week before it's posted, but it will be available. And so we're gonna walk through again some um, project examples to go over these key concepts that we're gonna walk through in a minute to kind of have some good takeaways from the end of this presentation. And um, again, thinking about how this fits into the permitting aspect of things, Andy will be here with us at the end, or as we're asking questions throughout the different project examples, he'll be a resource for us to help understand how that process works. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to David Bogardis to um, tell you all how to communicate with us and to also introduce our Stantec presenters. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Katasha. 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Bogardis. I'm the Senior Environmental Specialist with Stantec. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items, just so you know how to participate in today's event. We're taking a screen, we've taken a screenshot of the example of the attendee interface. You should see something like that on your, your own computer desktop on the upper right corner. If you have questions during any of the presentation, please type them into the box. We will be monitoring the questions as we go along and may answer them in the dialogue box at the end of each presentation, or they will be addressed towards the end of our presentation during the question and answer segment. Attendees are automatically muted. The webinar is being recorded. We will send out a notification to everyone who's registered when it's available on the OEM website. I would like to now introduce Nicole Carter and Joy Castro, who will be presenting the FDOT EFH case examples. Nicole Carter is a principal with Stantec and is the environmental team leader for South Florida. She has over 22 years of experience conducting environmental resource analysis for transportation related projects under NEPA and state regulations. She has worked extensively for FDOT on projects ranging from planning and pd &E studies through design and construction compliance. Her experience includes NEPA documentation and reevaluation preparation, agency consultation, natural resources, social and contamination impact assessments, and permitting. Nicole holds an undergraduate degree in marine biology from the University of Miami and a master's degree in marine biology from Nova Southeastern University. Joy Castro is an environmental scientist with Stantec. Her training and skills encompass social, cultural, natural, and physical resource impact assessments, environmental uh, regulations at the federal, state, and local levels, and National Environmental Policy Act compliance. Joy has over seven years of experience in the environmental, engineering, and construction industries, and has extensive experience coordinating with regulatory agencies, local municipalities and the public during all phases of production, project production. Joy holds an undergraduate degree in biology, biological sciences from Florida International University and a master's degree in environmental health from Emory University. Thank you, Joy and Nicole for participating. Today, we will be providing three FDOT project examples to demonstrate these 10 key EFH activities. Instead of just going through the PDD manual with you, we wanted to show how these activities were applied in actual projects. Some of these activities may be familiar to you, while others may not be. We have weaved these activities throughout the presentation so that you can see how they were applied and what that meant to the successful coordination and permitting of the project. These activities include the role of technical assistance, project assessment, what's in a consultation package, permitting aspects, the timing of activities, the differences between ESA and EFA consultations, determining the right mitigation strategy, mitigation innovation, conservation recommendations, and the reinitiation of consultation. After going through the project examples, we will hear from NIMPS, the Army Corps of Engineers, OEM, and on EFH, and close out with a question and answer session. As we have NIMPS and the Army Corps of Engineers participation, we encourage you to take the opportunity to ask any EFH questions that you may have. I would like to now turn it over to Dave Rydeen with the West Coast Habitat Conservation Division of NIMPS. Thank you, Dave. All right, thanks, David. So uh, as you heard, I'm Dave Rydine. I'm with the National Marine Fisheries Service. We are a part of NOAA, so we're sometimes referred to as NOAA Fisheries. Um, so we have two different names. So I'm gonna be talking about coordination between NOAA Fisheries and the Florida Department of Transportation today in terms of EFH and also somewhat ESA. We can go to the next slide. 
Okay, so so our mission statement is uh, we're involved with the stewardship of living marine resources through science-based conservation and management for the promotion of healthy ecosystems. And we do that by using the best available science to promote the stewardship of the resources we're responsible for. And we provide that service to agencies like Florida DOT in term, terms of doing EFH and ESA consultations. So we can go to the next slide. So when you come to NIMS um, to deal with EFH, essential fish habitat and ESA issues, Endangered Species Act issues, you're dealing with two different divisions within our agencies. The first is Habitat Conservation Division. That's the ones that deal with the essential fish habitat consultations. And that is, uh, is was put together when uh, there was a modification of the Mag magnuson Stephen Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Um, the other division you deal with would be Protected Resource Division for Endangered Species Act consultations and possibly Marine Mammal Protection Act, although that's much less likely. Um, and that the Endangered Species Act is the legislation that put endangered species and threatened species consultations. And those would be Section 7 consultations that you'd be dealing with with FDOT. Um, and, and that that mission is to conserve and protect threatened and endangered species, um, hopefully with the goal that they will recover to the point that they can be taken off the list at some point. Some species also have something that's called designated critical habitat. And if that is the case, you'd also be dealing with critical habitat in the consultation. OK, we can go to the next slide. So when do you need to do a consultation with NIMPS? So for the habitat conservation side, you would need to do an EFH consultation if we determine that EFH may be adversely affected. Now, the other part of that is that there's gotta be some kind of federal connection. So you may be using federal money to build the road or bridge, or you may have to get a permit from a federal agency like the Corps or the Coast Guard and so if we determine that there's an adverse impact EFH, you do the consultation and the adverse effect is defined as any impact which reduces, reduces the quality or quantity of EFH. And so when we look at the project and we determine, determine the effects, um, if there's going to be negative effects, there's sort of a three-tiered process we go through. First, if those impacts can be avoided, that's the best best outcome, that's what we're shooting for, then you don't even have to do the consultation because there's no effects. There's usually gonna be some unavoidable impacts, especially for projects like bridges. So in that case, you try to minimize those impacts to the extent that you can, and then whatever unavoidable impacts are left after minimization, then we have to come up with some kind of compensatory mitigation to offset those impacts. On the protected resources side, it's the same, idea you have to have some kind of federal connection federal money federal permits are needed um, and the goal there is we don't want to jeopardize the existence of any of the species that are listed under the endangered species act and also if there is critical habitat involved we have to avoid destroying or adversely modifying that critical habitat so when you do determination, determinations under the ESA, there's three things that could occur. You can call no effect, in which case you don't have to do the consultation. And, and as long as we don't disagree with that determination, that's the end of it. Um, there's two different may effects. You can have may effect, not likely to adversely affect. In that case, you're gonna do an informal consultation with a, you get a letter of concurrence from us, assuming we agree with that determination. And that's the end of it. If it's may affect, and it is likely to adversely affect, then you have to do a formal consultation, which is a more involved process. We have to create a biological opinion, um, which is a larger document. It takes longer to write, and it's just a little, it's more involved. It's got more information in it. So we can go to the next slide. So back to EFH, what is essential fish habitat? Well, it's defined in the Magnuson-Stevens Act as waters and substrate necessary to fish for spawning, breeding, feeding, or growth to maturity. So essential fish habitat is determined based on the species that are in fishery management plans that are put out by fishery management councils. So on the Gulf side, 
there's the Gulf Council on the Atlantic side, it's the South Atlantic Council, and they're separate entities. So the, the fishery management plans are not exactly the same, although there are some joint plans. Um, so EFH is based on all the species that are in those fishery management plans and all the different life stages of those species. So you end up covering a lot of different habitats because of that. Um, within EFH, there is a subset of EFH that's called habit, habitat areas of particular concern. And these are areas that are considered rare, uh, particularly susceptible to human-induced degradation, uh, important ecologically, or located in an area that's already under stress, usually from some kind of human activities. So there is a difference between the Gulf and the Atlantic side in terms of HAPCs because the councils designated them slightly differently. You're probably not going to have to deal with HAPCs on the Gulf side because the HAPCs that were designated there are place-based things and they're offshore. Uh, it's places like the Florida Middle Grounds or uh, Flower Gardens, places like that. So you're not going to probably have to deal with them there. On the Atlantic side, it's a little different because they're, they're using place-based uh, areas there too, but they also have some very broad categories like all mangroves, all corals, all seagrasses. So it's possible you have to deal with HAPCs on the Atlantic side. The only real difference in the consultation is that HAPCs get more scrutiny because they're considered particularly important for fishery productivity. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so why do we have to protect so many different kinds of habitats? Well, it's basically because um, any given fish species has a number of different life stages, and typically they will change the habitat that they're living in based on what life stage they're at. So when they're first eggs and larvae, they're up in the water column, then they will settle sometimes into a habitat like seagrasses, where they grow, grow to be juveniles and they get large enough and then they move up, may move off to a habitat like mangroves for a while and get larger still and then at some point they become adults and they're ready to reproduce and they'll end up on coral reefs. So because different species use different habitats at different points in their life cycle, um, we need to protect all those habitats so that the species can complete their life cycle and reproduce. Okay, we can go to the next one. So here's some examples of fishery management plans, EFH and HAPCs. So the fishery management plans are on the left there. Um, some, some fishery management plans only have a few species in them, like the shrimp plan only has uh, four species, um, but something like the reef fish has 40 plus species. So with all those species and all those life stages, um, you cover a lot of different habitats. In the center there are some examples of essential fish habitat. Uh, the ones that we get particularly concerned about are things like seagrasses and mangroves and corals and salt marsh and oyster reefs. Um, we certainly, the other ones are important as well, but um, we tend to focus more on things like seagrasses and corals uh, that are very important for fish productivity. The habitat areas of particular concern, there's some examples on the right. Like I said, some of them are place-based like the Florida Middle Grounds off, offshore of Tampa. Well, as on the Atlantic side, there's some that are more broad categories like seagrasses and mangroves. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So here's an example of the EFH consultation process. So a federal agency, or in this case, since FDOT has NEPA assignment now, FDOT can come on behalf of half of federal highways, come to us and ask us, do we need to do an EFH consultation? If we decide that there can be adverse effects to EFH, then we go into the next stage. This is the next one is just some documents and the timelines associated with those. If we get to the point where we do the consultation and we decide that there's still going to be adverse effects to EFH, we put out a document that has something called EFH conservation recommendations. Now, I don't do a lot of these because we start so early in the process. The idea is we really want to get all this stuff resolved before we get to permitting or before we're doing the EFH consultation. And in that case, if we can get things to a minimal level, we don't have to do the conservation recommendations. If we do, however, uh, the federal agency has 30 days to respond to that. And one of three things can happen. 
they can say, yeah, fine, we will adopt your recommendations and then we will respond to that within 10 days and that would be the end of the consultation. I'm back, I guess, I, I think. Um, so anyways, they can adopt the recommendations. They can say they can't do it and tell us why, and then we'll respond to that within 10 days. Or we can go into an interim response where the consultation is ongoing until we get to the point where one of those first two things happens. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so here's some examples of threatened and endangered species under the ESA Act that you might encounter in Florida. Some of these are just on one side, on the Atlantic side or on the Gulf side, some are on both sides. So Johnson seagrass, that's just Southeast Florida. The turtles could be on either coast. Same with small tooth sawfish could be either coast. The sturgeon, Gulf sturgeon is just on the Gulf coast and short nose and Atlantic sturgeon are on the Atlantic coast. Nassau grouper would just be in Southeast Florida. It's not considered to occur in the Gulf. Um, the same with the corals, that would just be the Atlantic side. Uh, there are some marine mammals that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, it's probably not likely you're going to be dealing with that very much just because of the nature of those species and where they are, occur, but it is a possibility. Okay, we can go to the next one. So people get kind of baffled about why is there ESA consultations and then another consultation for EFH. So part of the, the issue there is that those two entities are fall under two different pieces of legislation that were enacted at different points in time. So the ESA was enacted first, um, and then the EFH was came into being later when they modified the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And there's really two different processes, and and like I said, there's you're dealing with two different divisions within NIMS when you do these consultations. Now, because of the nature of the funding agreement that we have with FDOT. Jen and I do both types of consultations, although that is actually an exception to the rule. If you were a Joe Public and you were going to the Corps to get a permit to build your single family dock, when the Corps comes to us, they would actually be dealing with two biologists, one from habitat conservation and one from protected resources, but that's not the case with FDOT. So it makes things a little smoother. There's more continuity because you're not dealing with two different folks. Um, EFH and ESA do also have different timelines. We usually can get an EFH consultation done in about 30 days. Uh, ESA, if you go into formal consultation, that could be as long as 135 days. And the other thing is that we usually have the information we need to do the EFH consultation earlier in the process um, than is the case with ESA, because EFH, we just re really need a good ballpark park idea of, of how, how big the impacts would be to EFH, how much acreage would be involved and what kind of resources. With ESA, especially for things like bridges where there can be pile driving noise issues, we really need to wait till design most of the time because we need to know specifics about the construction methodology and the and what types of materials are going to be used with piles, you know, what kind of piles, how big are they, are they going to put them in with an impact hammer or a vibratory hammer, how many strikes are there going to be per day or how many seconds of vibratory and a lot of technical details like that so we can do the noise analysis. So that's another reason. We usually get the EFH done ahead of the ESA and the ESA comes later when we have all the information we need for that. Another difference between EFH and ESA is you can use compensatory mitigation to offset EFH impacts, but because of the way ESA is written and the way our attorneys interpret it, you cannot you can't do compensatory mitigation and make up for for ESA type problems. Um, so that may change at some point in time, but that's the way we do it now. Uh, the other issue is that so a species can sometimes be an ESA list, listed species and also be EFH. So with Johnson seagrass or the corals, they're listed under the ESA, but they are also benthic habitats, so they're also EFH. Um, some species, NIMS actually shares responsibility with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, for example, turtles, if they're swimming around in the water, there are responsibility, but once they go up on the beach to nest, it becomes under the purview of Fish and Wildlife Service. And so one of the points that I do want to make clear is that we're always available to help you folks out, no matter where in the process the project is. So please don't hesitate to come to us and we'll help you out with whatever issues you're having. We can go to the next one. 
Okay, so we have a, a funding agreement, an agency agreement with FDOT, and that actually supplies funding for both Jen Schill's position and my and my own. Uh, we do both EFH and ESA uh, Section 7 consultations, like I said. We're always here to provide advice on projects to help avoid and minimize impacts and figure out uh, a good compensatory mitigation to offset the loss of ecological services due to EFH impacts. Always try to use the best scientific and commercial data we can to make our decisions. Uh, like I said, we work with the with FDOT and the other agencies that are involved, the uh, other resource agencies, from the conceptual stage of a project all the way through permitting. Um, we also support some environmental and research initiatives, like right now FDOT has hired some folks at University of North Florida to do a study of pile driving noise. So we've been involved with that process, reviewed their protocols, um, when those came out and we get updates on their progress as things are moving along, which is a little slower because of COVID, but they're still making headway. Um, one of the important things we do is we advise on the appropriateness of mit mitigation activities uh, to make sure that whatever's proposed is going to be adequate to make up for whatever impacts there are. And uh, in the pre-COVID era, we used to do site visits and compliance inspections and go to in-person meetings, but of course we can't travel right now. Hopefully that'll change by the end of this year, but we uh, we used to do that and hopefully we can do it again soon. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, so what are the benefits of this partnership between FDOT and NIMS? Well, because Jen and I are fund, have funded positions that for money we get from FDOT, you know your projects are always going to get looked at because that is our job. That's what we do. Um, you know you're going to get coordination very early and very often all the way through the process to make sure everything stays on track. Uh, like was said earlier, I've been doing this for 16 years. A lot of these folks at FDOT, I've been working with them for the whole 16 years. Um, I know them very well. We've developed friendships. Uh, we have confidence and trust in each other. Everybody knows what's expected of everybody else. And so that helps to uh, smooth the process too and make things go, go along faster. Um, the other benefit is we identify fatal flaws. So in the old days before ETDM and all this stuff, a lot of times the resource agencies would not see a project till it got to the Corps or the Coast Guard to get their permits. And all, a lot of money had been spent on studies and design and things like that. And sometimes we'd see the project and say, oh my God, you can't do that. You, there's a problem here. And so that created a very contentious relationship. Um, and it created delays, cost overruns, people haven't gone, I mean, some projects just got shelved, other things had to be modified and redesigned. So that was a bad way to do things. So now we come in early and we try to get all that stuff worked out um, on the front end so that by the time you get to permitting, you're good to go. There's no, there's no back and forth and all that stuff. Uh, it's helped to reduce costs, reduce roadblocks, late project challenges, litigation. Um, we try to be very open and transparent about the way we make decisions and the information we use. And there's, you know, we do a lot of record keeping to have a good administrative record. Uh, like I said, it's streamlined the per permitting process, process because you don't have to do all that back and forth. And it helps both FDOT and NIMS conserve and protect essential fish habitat and protected species through avoidance, minimization, and then thoughtful mitigation for the unavoidable impacts. And um, we're always here to provide guidance on avoidance and minimization and the appropriateness of any compensatory mitigation that's going to be necessary. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And that's my talk for today. And uh, I will be taking questions later, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I see we do have uh, one question for you, if um, we have a, a moment. What? Uh, what is the most common mistake you see with EFH consultations? Um, common mistake. Well, I mean, sometimes they come in a little early and then the project changes later and then you gotta have to go back to the drawing board and do the consultation again if, if you know, the impacts increase substantially because of some kind of design change. Um, so that would probably be the principal one I can think of. Okay, thank you. 
As a reminder, you can submit questions throughout the presentation in your attendee control panel. At this time, I'd like to introduce Joy Castro to give her first to give our first project example. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, David. I'm going to be talking about the First Coast Expressway project, which was an EIS. So in the early 2000s, FDOT District 2 identified the need for an improved highway corridor and bridge that would cross the St. Johns River between Clay and St. Johns counties in Northeast Florida. The St. Johns River separates Clay and St. Johns counties, and the Shands Bridge is the only direct connection between the two counties within the project area. Through a series of technical studies, public meetings, and agency coordination efforts, DOT identified and refined 10 build alternatives, which were evaluated in detail along with the no build alternative. All build alternatives involved a new bridge across the St. Johns River. The existing Shands Bridge is a two lane bridge of approximately 6,662 feet long. This project will replace the existing two lane Shands Bridge with a new four lane bridge located directly north of and adjacent to the existing bridge. The new bridge will also include pedestrian features. Construction on the new bridge is expected to begin in 2022 and be completed in 2029. Construction methods with the potential to affect EFH include barge use, pile driving activities, shoreline dredging, and demolition. In August 2005, FDOT distributed the advanced notification package to the ETAT agencies, including NIMS, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, and St. John's River Water Management District. NIMS responded to the advanced notification package as an ETAT member and provided comments through the Efficient Transportation Decision-Making Environmental Screening Tool. NIMS commented on coastal and marine resources, wetlands, and wildlife and habitat. NIMS also commented that the project may directly and indirectly impact EFH, as well as listed species under NIMS purview. The NIMS recommended an EFH assessment to comply with the Magnuson-Stevens Act and a biological assessment to comply with the Endangered Species Act. NIMS also requested for avoidance and minimization measures, a stormwater management plan, and a detailed mitigation plan to be prepared and provided for NIMS review and response. FDOT used wetlands identified in the Wetlands Evaluation Report in conjunction with National Wetlands Inventory Mapping and NIMS coordination to determine essential fish habitat associated with the wetlands in the tidally influenced waterways, including portions of Black Creek and the St. Johns River. There were several challenges associated with developing the methodology to determine the extent of EFH in the project area. Some of these challenges were that this project entails a large geographic study area, there were many build alternatives under study, and multiple tidal and non-tidally influenced surface waters exist in the project area. This is important because in addition to submerged aquatic vegetation such as seagrasses, tidal wetlands are considered to be EFH. So this differentiation is used to help quantify potential EFH impacts. Other challenges in developing the methodology were the lack of existing high resolution elevation data and the technical level of data required to estimate and calculate potential EFH impacts. Due to these challenges, DOT coordinated with NIMS to determine the best methodology for delineating EFH in the project area. In May 2011, the decision was made to utilize a 20-foot topographic contour line as a starting point for determining the extent of potential EFH wetlands. All Palestrine forested wetlands which exhibited a hydrologic connection to the St. Johns River and or its tributaries and were located within or below the 20-foot contour were selected as potential EFH. Using the same methodology, the wetland areas within each proposed build alternative as identified in the wetlands evaluation report, were then selected as being potential direct EFH impacts. It was also agreed that the wetlands within the 20-foot contour upstream of a build alternative crossing, which is a river, cream, creek, stream, tributary, associated wetland, et cetera, could be considered potential indirect EFH impacts for the purposes of this study. Additionally, DOT conducted a desktop GIS analysis using data from the St. Johns River Water Management District, which were supplemented by field visits to the project area to assess submerged aquatic vegetation in the St. Johns River where the respective alternative corridors cross. Then in spring 2015, 
DOT conducted a NIMS requested tidal gauge study to further determine EFH limits. The tide gauge studies were conducted at the tidal water body crossings. Biological markers such as the moss and lichen line were used to determine mean high water and seasonal high water elevations. These elevations were marked by surveyors and then LIDAR derived contours as shown on this slide were drawn to quantify the lateral extent of the floodplain. This information was then utilized to establish the final extent of EFH and replaced the use of the 20 foot contour as an interim means for delineating potential EFH. This final methodology was then used to finalize the EFH impact analysis documented in the EIS. Potential EFH, habitat areas of particular concern, and managed species impacts were identified and analyzed as part of the EFH assessment. Several EFH categories were identified in the project area, estuarine emergent wetlands, estuarine water column and bottom, palestrine forested, herbaceous and emergent wetlands, and submerged aquatic vegetation. Based on the fishery management plans prepared by the South Atlantic and Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Councils, federally managed fishery resources with the potential to occur in the project area include the eggs and larvae of brown shrimp, white shrimp, and pink shrimp. In addition to these federally managed species, the tidally influenced portions of the St. Johns River and associated tributaries also serve as a nursery for other commercially and recreationally important species such as Atlantic croaker and striped mullet and the federally listed short-nosed sturgeon. These fish also serve as the food source for other species included in fishery management plans such as the snapper grouper complex and migratory species including tuna and sharks, also managed by nymphs. The project is currently anticipated to impact approximately 37.97 acres of EFH, including 35.73 acres of tidally influenced freshwater wetlands and 2.24 acres of submerged aquatic vegetation. Minimal temporary construction impacts, including turbidity and sedimentation, are also likely to occur. DOT evaluated construction techniques during final design to determine the most appropriate technique for constructing structures, and final construction methods were selected as part of the permitting process. FDOT committed to the following actions to avoid, minimize, or mitigate for EFH impacts. Evaluating, considering, and implementing design and construction techniques, which lead to the continued avoidance and minimization of wetland impacts to include EFH impacts. Mitigating all wetland impacts to include EFH impacts as a result of the construction of the preferred alternative. Working with the agencies and developing a regional wetland mitigation plan as the project progressed into the design phase. This plan would establish procedures, guidelines, and responsibilities to implement regionally significant mitigation for unavoidable impacts caused by the St. Johns River Crossing Project and other future DOT projects within the jurisdictional boundaries of St. Johns River Water Management District. DOT also committed to continuing to coordinate with the resource agencies in developing the framework for a regional wetland mitigation plan. Mitigating for submerged aquatic vegetation impacts through water quality improvement initiatives, DOT developed a draft mitigation plan as part of the EFH assessment. This plan outlined options for improving water quality by reducing the nutrient loading conditions in areas with submerged aquatic vegetation. Finally, restoration of the near shore areas upon the removal of the existing Shands Bridge. Although many of these measures pertain to development of the mitigation plan, DOT was able to implement some of the avoidance and minimization measures during design. These included reducing the proposed right-of-way requirements, adjusting the alignments to avoid major wetland systems, and selection of pond sites such that little or no wetland impact would occur. NIMS provided conservation recommendations in 2010 as part of the NIMS response to the draft environmental impact statement. DOT provided an interim response within 30 days of receiving the EFH conservation recommendations. Numerous informal meetings were then held with NIMPS to further refine the methodology and process for estimating and assessing potential impacts to EFH for the build alternatives. DOT also committed to continuing coordination and consultation with NIMPS as the project progressed toward the final design and permitting phases. In fall 2017, NIMPS provided permit-specific conservation recommendations as part of the response to the public notice for the core permit application. These conservation recommendations, which included mitigation plan requirements, such as the description of success criteria, cross sections of the mitigation areas, and a vegetative planting plan for the mitigation sites, did not come as a surprise to DOT since coordination had been ongoing for years. 
Instead, these conservation recommendations served as formal documentation of the mitigation plan requirements that were already being discussed as part of DOT's coordination efforts. In March 2018, after submittal of the detailed mitigation plan for offsetting unavoidable impacts to EFH and non-EFH wetlands, NIMS prepared a letter documenting that the permit applicant, in this case DOT, had met its responsibilities under the Magnuson-Stevens Act and the regulations for implementing the EFH provisions of the Act. With this letter, EFH consultation for the First Coast Expressway project was officially completed. During the permitting of the project, DOT requested NIMS ESA consultation for protected species and their designated habitats under NIMS jurisdiction. NIMS initiated ESA Section 7 consultation in April 2018. The Endangered Species Biological Assessment prepared in 2012 concluded the potential for short nose and Atlantic sturgeon to occur within the project area is low, and the project is not located in designated critical habitat for these species, and that no impacts are anticipated to these species as a result of the project. Temporary and permanent habitat alterations may result in impacts to the available foraging and refuge habitat for sturgeon that may be in the area, but due to the low likelihood of occurrence in the project area, these impacts were determined to be insignificant. No significant noise or vibration impacts are anticipated to the sturgeon as a result of jetting, augering, or pile driving. Therefore, an effect determination of may affect, not likely to adversely affect, was made for both the short nose and Atlantic sturgeon. A NIMS Section 7 checklist for the Shands Bridge documented proposed construction methods determined during the design phase, including pile driving ramp up procedures consisting of initial operation at low power levels with a gradual increase to the minimum levels required for pile installation. Protection and conservation measures will also be implemented for sturgeon. In June 2018, NIMS concurred that the project is not likely to adversely affect ESA listed species under NIMS purview. NIMS noted that consultation must be reinitiated if a take occurs or if new information reveals effects of the action not previously considered. One final point regarding the, the informal ESA Section 7 consultation process for this project is that although ESA consultation was completed over a relatively short period of time after years of ongoing project coordination, the assumption should never be made that extensive coordination will result in shorter NIMS consultation times. Keep in mind that the time NIMS takes to review a project depends on many factors, including existing workload and staff availability. Because of this, it is generally safer to assume that NIMS will take the full review time allotted by law. However, it is still important to coordinate with NIMS as appropriate throughout all phases of a project. This practice will ultimately ensure a more streamlined consultation process compared to projects for which coordination did not occur regularly, since early and ongoing coordination allows NIMS to become familiarized with the project and provide valuable feedback up front. Due to the complexity of this large project, there were several challenges to development of the mitigation plan. First, multiple resource and permitting agencies were directly involved in coordinating and developing viable mitigation options. It can be challenging to coordinate with so many agencies at once, but this strategy was beneficial because the individual agencies were able to help ensure that the final mitigation plan addressed all agency requirements. Another challenge was that this project was determined to have significant EFH impacts. Impacts were initially anticipated for approximately 183.44 acres of EFH, including 2.24 acres of submerged aquatic vegetation and 180.94 acres of tidal wetlands. After avoidance and minimization measures were developed, the project is currently anticipated to result in approximately 35.73 acres of direct impacts to tidal freshwater wetlands and 2.24 acres of submerged aquatic vegetation impacts. Due to the high amount of EFH impacts anticipated, there was also concern that the number and type of mitigation credits required might not be available when needed. This is a common challenge for DOT projects in the eastern portion of the state. So it's always a good idea to consider multiple mitigation options that can serve as backup if credits are not available when needed. In this way, negative impacts to the project schedule can be avoided. Finally, all agencies involved in development of the mitigation plan agreed that due to the large complex nature of the project, a regional wetland mitigation plan was needed. The agencies agreed upon several location requirements for the mitigation plan. Mitigation banks should be located within close proximity of the project, and any mitigation areas must be regionally significant, under demonstrated development pressures, and beneficial to the establishment of high quality, uninterrupted habitat linking natural and preserved areas throughout the Northeast Florida region.
After years of extensive coordination with resource and permitting agencies, the mitigation plan was finalized during the design phase once more information was known about the project design and construction methods. The permittee responsible mitigation plan developed by St. John's River Water Management District was designed to restore and enhance EFH, including submerged aquatic vegetation in the lower St. John's River system. The St. John's River Water Management District is purchasing two land parcels adjacent to the Deep Creek Conservation Area, shown here. The proposed plan includes grading the ponds and fields and restoring the hydrological connection to Deep Creek to restore tidally influenced freshwater wetlands and EFH. Invasive plants will be removed and native vegetation planted. The project will restore and enhance 168.51 acres that will be managed in perpetuity as part of the Deep Creek Conservation Area. Impacts to submerged aquatic vegetation will be offset through the same permittee responsible mitigation plan developed by the St. John's River Water Management District. This plan includes the scrape down of 2.21 acres of land adjacent to the existing Shands Bridge to below the mean high water line and the planting of native submerged aquatic vegetation species that will be harvested from nearby grass beds, which will ultimately be shaded by the new bridge when constructed. The shoreline will be planted with native vegetation and stabilized with riprap. For both mitigation projects, the St. John's River Water Management District provided suitable work plans and monitoring plans that have explicit measurable success criteria and call for adaptive management if it appears success criteria are not being met. Both mitigation projects have been approved and will start prior to commencement of road and bridge construction. It should be noted that EFH and ESA coordination with NIMS took place over more than a decade. NIMS responded to the advanced notification package in 2005, participated in field reviews in 2008, and reviewed the draft EIS and responded with conservation recommendations in 2010. In May 2011, NIMS and DOT agreed on using the 20-foot contour to delineate EFH for the EIS process. Extensive coordination continued through 2013 when NIMS reviewed the final EIS. In spring 2015, DOT conducted that NIMS requested tidal gauge study referenced earlier, and in November 2015, NIMS and DOT completed the field assessment for establishing the extent of EFH. As discussed previously, this method used the seasonal high water elevation for establishing EFH boundaries and replaced the interim method that used a 20-foot contour line. The EFH and submerged aquatic vegetation mitigation plan was then finalized and submitted in 2017. In March 2018, NIMS provided the concurrence letter, thus completing EFH consultation for the first coast expressway project. The Corps and St. John's River Water Management District permits were obtained in 2018, and construction is anticipated to begin next year in 2022. As you can see, this project took place over a long period of time. Three different NIMS habitat specialists were involved in reviewing the first Coast Expressway project, but thanks to thorough coordination efforts and a clean project file, NIMS was able to seamlessly hand off the project from one biologist to the next. This is why it is so important to coordinate often with NIMS during consultation, and why it is so crucial to maintain a robust project file throughout the development of a project. In summary, it's important to involve NIMS in the project development process as early as possible so EFH consultation can be conducted and completed as smoothly as possible with minimal delays. The DOT ETDM process is in place to ensure that agency coordination is initiated early in the life of a major project but it is in the district's best interest to ensure that agency coordination occurs continuously throughout project development and into design and permitting as needed. Seemingly minor design changes could significantly impact EFH or ESA consultation determinations. This is especially important for large complex projects, which may require years of coordination. The lengthy timeline of many projects is another reason to ensure that a meticulous project file is maintained throughout the life of a project. A clean project file will ensure that all who work on the project, whether DOT employees, consultants, or agency personnel, will be able to clearly follow a project's history and ensure that all project requirements are fulfilled without any items slipping through the cracks. In this way, impacts to an already lengthy project schedule can be avoided and minimized to the greatest extent possible. There are also several strategies that can be used to develop mitigation plans for large projects with significant EFH impacts. If all relevant agencies are involved in the development of the mitigation plan, the team can develop an open, transparent relationship and work together to develop a plan that will satisfy all agency requirements. Given the multiple challenges that often arise during development of the mitigation plan, 
it is beneficial to consider multiple mitigation options to avoid potential project delays. Also, it is a good idea to seek out innovative mitigation options to ensure all resource agency mitigation requirements are fulfilled. These innovative ideas should be coordinated with OEM, NIMS, and other resource and permitting agencies as needed, but thinking outside the box is ultimately a useful tool when trying to develop comprehensive mitigation plans for large, complex projects such as First Coast Expressway. If the successful strategies employed during the development of the First Coast Expressway project are followed for other projects involving NIMS consultation, the likelihood of surprises such as fatal flaws, litigation, or lengthy delays will be significantly reduced. Finally, I would like to give Jen Scholl the opportunity to provide any final remarks regarding her experience with this project. Hi, um, Joy, beautiful job. Um, I don't think anybody could just describe the, the kind of history and, and iterations of this project better. Um, and it's one of my favorite projects to highlight simply for, for all of the reasons that you laid out. Um, when I came on as the ETA representative in 2017, there had already been significant coordination on this project. And because the project file was so um, well maintained um, and there was very clear documentation on all of the different iterations of this project as it kind of evolved, um, I was able to kind of step in and pick up where prior NIMS employees left off and um, continue to provide, you know, kind of the National Marine Fishery Service uh, services um, to uh, to the SAFDOT project um, in, in a in a very um, efficient way, um, and I think it's a great example of using avoidance and minimization successfully. As you mentioned, there was a huge uh, decrease in EFH impacts on this project, which we'd love to see, and um, and it's been able to kind of move forward into the permitting phase pretty pretty seamlessly. So. Um, thank you for uh, highlighting this project, and it's been it's been a pleasure to work on it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Joy and Jen. Um, we did uh, have one question with the time that we have. Um, with such a, a, a large project as this, how were you able to to determine uh, the impacts? Um, could you provide a little more detail on that as well as um, the use of, of UMIM for that? Yes, so as mentioned, this is definitely a very complex project uh, with a really large study area. So it was very difficult to determine EFH impacts. And through coordination with NIMS, DOT was able to develop this kind of unique approach uh, whereby there was an interim methodology that was initially used as part of the development of the EIS, and that was the use of the 20-foot contour that was mentioned previously, where this 20-foot contour was the starting point, and within the contour and uh, if there was a hydrologic connection to the St. John's River, then those wetlands were considered potential EFH and any tidally influenced wetlands that were within the contour upstream of the alternative were then considered potential indirect EFH. So this was just a, an interim means of determining potential EFH impacts just for the beginning process. And then once more information was known, then this tidal gauge study was conducted in 2015. Uh, the, that 20-foot contour I was mentioning previously was, uh, that, that methodology was developed in 2011. So then four or five years later was then when more information was known and the tidal gauge study was conducted. And uh, in that case, then biological markers such as the moss and lichen line were used to determine mean high water and seasonal high water elevations. And that was then used to finalize the extent of the EFH in the project area so that then final impacts could be could be used. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd like to uh, have our next speaker, uh, Nicole Carter, uh, come on and discuss the Venetian Causeway Bridge. 
I see that we have a number of questions that have come in. We will address them, but we'll, we'll save some of those for the question and answer section towards the end. So at this point, Nicole, I'd like to, to hand it off to you. Great, thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. I'll be giving an overview of the Venetian Causeway Bridges p and &E study uh, that was initiated in 2013, and we are currently preparing an environmental assessment for the project. The Venetian Causeway is approximately two and a half miles long, comprised of a series of 10 fixed span low-level bridges and two basket bridges, which connect the city of Miami to the city of Miami Beach in Miami-Dade County. The project is entirely within Biscayne Bay, a designated aquatic preserve and outstanding Florida water. Therefore, the study had to balance potential impacts to the marine environment, uh, the historic character of the bridge as it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and also ensure access for the residents uh, which reside on the residential islands um, throughout the causeway. Next slide. <clears throat> the causeway is owned and operated by Miami-Dade County and it's off the state highway system. So in this case, DOT is conducting the p and &E study in coordination with the county and we've invited the U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as cooperating agencies. The county will then uh, be responsible for design and building the project and they'll also be responsible for the NEPA reevaluation and the permitting. Uh, DOT will remain involved through a lab agreement as the county will seek federal dollars for construction in the future. We're currently evaluating three alternatives for additional study, which include the no, the no action, uh, bridge rehabilitation, and bridge replacement. The replacement alternative uh, will be shown as the preferred alternative at our upcoming public hearing this spring. Next slide. So the advanced notification package was originally submitted for comment back in 2011. Agency coordination continued and the ETDM programming screen summary report was published in 2016. During the ETDM screening, uh, NIMPS indicated that Biscayne Bay was in the project area. Uh, there's moderate to high quality essential fish habitat types throughout the area. Uh, NIMPS requested the relocation of corals uh, as feasible and requested the DOT also consider the relocation of barrel sponges um, as an EFH avoidance and minimization measure and indicated you know, less mitigation will be required if sponges and corals could be relocated. And ultimately, um, a determination of substantial for coastal and marine environment uh, was determined. Next slide. So our analysis began with a desktop review of the EST and the NIMPS EFH mapper to identify the different types of essential fish habitat, habitat areas of particular concern, and species usage. The EFH types we have in our project area include sand and shell bottom, corals, macroalgae, sponges, and seagrass, which provide foraging areas for managed fish species, manatees, sea turtles, invertebrates, as well as shelter and habitat for post-larval and juvenile fish species. Biscayne Bay is also considered an outstanding Florida water, which means it's subject to additional protection measures. Um, and the area is designated as critical habitat for Johnson seagrass by NIMPS and designated critical habitat for the West Indian manatee uh, by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Next slide. So we went ahead and conducted our original benthic survey in 2014. However, due to project delays, we resurveyed the area in 2017, as NIMPS prefers that the EFH assessment be based on a more recent survey. And we did find that the results between the two surveys, although three years apart, were consistent. Our survey included the area beneath the bridges, as well as 60 feet to the north and south of the face of the existing bridges. And that was to identify any potential resources that could be impacted by uh, potential widening or by construction equipment, such as barges or marine vessels during construction. The project area depths range from zero to 15 feet. And while most of the habitat around the project area is bare sand with limited amounts of macroalgae and seagrass, there are significant areas of riprap and hard bottom that harbor you know, flourishing communities of sponges, tunicates, octocorals, and hard corals. And we had some mangroves uh, present around the shorelines of the small fill islands that connect the bridges um, uh, in between the residential islands as shown in a slide here. Next slide. We found three different community types uh, during our benthic surveys. Um, this is an example of community one, which was made up of the shallow subtital zones bridge structures and riprap areas, which were observed at the east and west terminus of each bridge along the bridge pilings and the fenders. These areas provided substrate for hard and soft corals, mollusks, and crustaceans. 
Um, hard corals were typically small, isolated um, Cyderastria type species or other corals less than 10 centimeters in size. The corals were limited to the existing riprap areas around the seawalls and the small fill islands, and none were found on the actual bridge pilings themselves. Next slide. Community number two was a deeper water uh, environment with sandy bottom and with shell fragments, which was observed about five to 15 feet from the bridge edges. Within this area, we had a varying coverage of macroalgae, sponges, octocorals, and tunicates. Next slide. Community number three was made up of our seagrass patches, which we observed at seven out of the 12 bridges in very small isolated patches, which consisted mostly of paddle grass um, and was observed at the 55 to 60 foot mark from the existing bridge edges and accounted for less than 1% of our survey area. Next slide. So we anticipated uh, direct impacts of the benthic habitat from both build alternatives, the rehabilitation and the replacement. However, we consulted on the replacement alternative, which had the larger footprint of impact. Direct impacts to essential fish habitat uh, from this project would essentially be the result of the removal and construction of the bridge substructure, which included the removal of the existing piles to one foot below the mudline, dredging to remove the existing bascule pier, and installation of the new substructure uh, using drill shafts, and the area anticipated to be directly impacted is mainly limited to sponge, octocoral, and tunicate communities located on and adjacent to the uh, bridge pilings and directly beneath the bridge edges. We did identify some impacts to um, hard corals that were, as I mentioned, documented on the riprap and the debris, but no corals were on the, identified on the bridge pilings or seawalls. And just to point out, we did not identify any Elkhorn or Staghorn corals within the project area. Uh, we also evaluated um, direct shading impacts of EFH from the widening of the bridge deck as part of the replacement alternative. The deck will be 16 feet wider, eight foot to either side. Um, and this may result in the redistribution of the macroalgae communities below, but would not require mitigation. A direct seagrass impacts from either shading or use of construction equipment was not anticipated. As we mentioned, the seagrass patches were observed beyond, uh, 50 feet beyond the existing bridges. Uh, where widening or barge use would not occur. Uh, in addition, uh, both build alternatives would provide a net reduction in direct pollutants by eliminating the existing bridge covers and uh, installing a new stormwater system which would treat any um, outfall to the, to the bay. And as such, the impacts to EFH were considered to be minimal overall. Next slide. So one of our, our main challenges that we faced with this impact analysis was how to describe the construction means and methods at such an early phase and quantify impacts. Um, since we did not know yet what type of equipment would be used, uh, we had to make some assumptions regarding the potential temporary impacts from installation of sheet pile coffer dams for the vascular pier installation and for supporting the bridges since we plan to do a phased uh, construction plan building either side of the bridge um, in, in pieces. And then also uh, the drill shaft casings, uh, barge spudding, and what measures could we recommend to minimize these impacts? So um, in this case, you know, we use the section seven checklist to sort of guide this level of um, evaluation of potential impacts and what to include. And the key here for us was we use the conceptual MOT plan that was established by the engineers for the phase construction and we were able to develop an estimate of how many barges would be needed, how many um, days that barge would be deployed to each bridge, and the duration of and area of spudding that would be needed in order to quantify the temporary impacts. Next slide. Following our impact analysis, we evaluated the steps to avoid and minimize impacts, which of course is a much more effective strategy than trying to do any kind of compensatory mitigation later. Uh, DOT recommended uh, the the following steps to avoid and minimize impacts as part of our natural resource evaluation. Uh, these are all best practices that can help keep the consultation process going. So we can propose to conduct additional benthic surveys during design, uh, which would identify any new resources since pd &E. We propose to develop a detailed coral relocation plan during design and include any relocation of um, viable barrel sponges. 
And we propose to coordinate with Miami-Dade County to use the material from the bridge demolition in their artificial reef program. And we also looked at the implementation of best management practices during construction related to water quality protection, monitoring, um, and debris containment uh, during construction as well. Next slide. In response to our, our natural resource evaluation and as part of the conservation recommendations development, NIMS agreed with those avoidance and minimization measures, but then recommended um, additional measures, uh, such as delineating the seagrass beds that we found beyond, say, the work zone, but with surface buoys during the duration of construction so that barges and boats would avoid impacting those beds while accessing the site. Um, and they also requested a, a standalone conceptual mitigation plan, I'm sorry, conceptual relocation plan that would identify the species of corals to be relocated, a preliminary relocation site, and um, to identify the DOT would follow the FWC guidelines for relocation. So DOT prepared this plan and then committed to preparing the uh, revising it and preparing a detailed plan during design once a detailed coral inventory was available. NIMS also recommended that impacts to hard bottom or coral impacts due to barge budding be further evaluated during design. And you know, what we found um, in this process, uh, working with uh, the NIMS liaison, that there's different approaches to getting EFH done in the PD&E phase. And uh, as Joy mentioned too, you can engage your liaison in that decision-making process. The level of detail and information available during pd &E can vary for each and every project. And that's gonna really direct what can be done now and what can be done and finalized in later phases. And then documented in the NEPA commitments to provide those agencies with the insurances that the process will continue as planned. Um, for Venetian, we developed NEPA commitments um, for these measures so we could close out our EFH during pd &E and committed to implementing these measures and practices and best management practices um, and then agreed to work with NIMPS during design and permitting. Next slide. So we also evaluated threatened and endangered species under the jurisdiction of both U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fishery Service. On this slide here, we have the list of species evaluated under, under NIMPS jurisdiction within our, our NRE. And an interesting point here is that we do have Johnson seagrass and its critical habitat, which is both evaluated under ESA and also as an essential fish habitat. Um, so no Johnson seagrass was found during either of our benthic surveys, but we are still entirely within their critical habitat. Therefore, we entered into formal consultation for unavoidable impacts to Johnson seagrass critical habitat and a de determination of may affect likely to adversely affect, but yet not likely to destroy or adversely modify Johnson's designated critical habitat was documented in a biological opinion issued in November of 2020. The remainder of the species determinations were either no effect, may affect, not likely to adversely affect, or not present. Next slide. So this is a this slide shows a comparison of our EFH and ESA timeline. Um, initially, uh, DOT requested EFH and Section 7 consultation in August of 2019 with the submittal of the NRE to both U.S. Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fishery Service. However, after discussions with um, our NIMPS liaison, we withdrew the request so that we could provide some more complete information. Um, so coordinating the ESA and the EFH review process does re require a careful look at what you have for available information and then also at the project schedule. And in some cases, it may make sense to submit your NRE when not all details are ready for either agency, but with Venetian, although our NRE was not considered complete by NIMPS at that time of submittal, we had enough to complete our informal consultation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the process with Fish and Wildlife was complete by October of 2019, our informal consultation. And at that, and then we uh, moved on to working with our liaison to gather up additional information. And in December of 2019, our NRE was accepted uh, by NIMPS to begin consultation. And at that point, we began our EFH consultation went back and forth to develop the conservation recommendations and concluded that process in March of 2020. However, our formal ESA consultation did not actually initiate until June of 2020. And that gap in time was so that we could work with our liaison to gather enough information on construction, materials, and methodology to satisfy the reviewer's informational needs. And 
the key here was that we looked at the most impactful alternative in order to develop this level of detail, while at the same time erring on the side of caution and choosing longer durations of construction methodology like sputting, and then also committing to less impactful procedures such as vibrating and sheet pile and steel casings for the drill shafts, um, performing that vib the vibrating of the sheet pile during daylight hours, and then using drill shafts instead of driven piles to minimize noise impacts to marine species. Next slide. So through our, our EFH and ESA's processes, we definitely had some uh, lessons learned on the project. Um, we found that you know, how the process develops is very project specific. So the key to efficiently completing the EFH process during PD&E is, is really with early and often co coordination with your ETAT liaison. They're here to help throughout the process and not just during a, a ETDM review or once an NRE is complete, but a phone call to NIMS before submitting the NRE or submitting a draft NRE for initial review can really help define the process before officially initiating consultation. And this can assure you have the level of detail required and eliminate needs for withdrawal and resubmittal, which could affect your schedule. And with DOT having this unique opportunity to have dedicated staff that are involved from ETDM through PD&E consultation and continue to future phases for design and permitting. So we really need to capitalize on those relationships and efficiently use them to our advantage to complete our consultations during PD&E. Next slide. Another thing we learned, evaluating the level of construction means and methods that can be estimated during PD&E is essential to finalizing your impact analysis. Um, by estimating the more impactful alternative and using a conservative estimate of construction means and methods can help to minimize the risk of reopening consultation during design. And this will help facilitate and expedite the resource analysis and agency coordination during permitting. And using this conservative approach to the impact analysis is also an important strategy if you begin consultation before having a preferred alternative to ensure that you're covering all potential impacts in your consultation. And as we know, we don't always have all the pieces of project laid out in PD&E. Some details have to be more developed during design. We can use the NEPA commitments as a helpful tool to provide the agencies with the assurance that all the standards and procedures um, will be carried out in future phases as we outline in the conservation recommendations and use those to close out um, the PD&E process. So with that, I'd like to um, give Jen Scholl the opportunity to provide any final remarks regarding her experience with the project as well. I thanks so much, Nicole, and um, it's been a pleasure to work on this project with you um, and your team. Um, so this is a, a high profile project just uh, due to its kind of location and the cultural significance of the Venetian Causeway bridges. Um, so it's, it's definitely received a, a high level of scrutiny. Um, but yeah, it's a great example of kind of this iterative process between the um, ETAT representatives, um, the consultants, and FDOT. And in this case, um, the, the county will have a, a large role in, in building this project. Um, and so this is also a good example of a project where we didn't have kind of the final impact analysis, but because of the commitment that FDOT was able to make um, through the NEPA process, we felt confident that best practices were going to be used to finalize those impact analyses and, and kind of the, the relocation uh, of, of any kind of coral or, or sponge communities. And we felt like the commitments were being made to avoid uh, the seagrasses that might be in the area as well. So it's a gr great example of, of kind of the, the teamwork and the um, open and engaged communication throughout the life cycle of the project. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, time for, for me for one question. Uh, on the Venetian Causeway, what factors influence the constructability of the project? How did you work through those with NIMS? So there are, there are a lot of different factors in this particular project, given the nature of the project located within Biscayne Bay, um, the critical habitat, marine resources. Um, as I mentioned before, it's a, uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So there was a lot of community outreach on uh, the design of the bridge, uh, maintaining that low level character um, of the, the low level bridges. And, you know, the constructability, it's always a difficult thing here. It, like Jen said, it was great teamwork with working with our engineers and they actually employed their 
their construction staff and and discussed potential um, situations with them as to how to to best quantify how many barges are you going to have. Um, we did have a really detailed maintenance of traffic plan uh, where we were going to build the projects, um, sorry, the bridges and phases so as to maintain um, access for the residents. Um, being on a causeway, if we cut off, we if we took a bridge down, we would be eliminating their access east or west. So that phased construction, um, having that question answered in PD&E uh, helps us develop that um, construction means and methods, knowing that we're going to have to uh, dredge. We have to support um, uh, with temporary sheet pile. We had already made the commitment to use drill shafts instead of driven piles um, for noise reduction methodology for uh, the endangered species protection. So it was really, uh, it was, a, it was a team effort. It evolved over time. As Jen said, we, we really worked together at the end to come up with those details of everything from width of and, and length of sheet pile that could be used. So we really had to engage um, many different players. It wasn't just up to the environmental folks. We had to engage the engineers, um, look to uh, construction folks to get their input, um, which could be either from the engineering consultant side or could be from the district side as well um, to get that input and make sure that we had uh, the best um, impact analysis evaluated. Great, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. At this time, um, I'd like to um, introduce our next project. Uh, Joy Castro um, will be doing uh, our third project example. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, David. Uh, this one is a type two CADEX in District 7, the I-275 Howard Franklin Bridge Project. The Howard Franklin Bridge is located in Hillsborough and Pinellas counties. This bridge is one of three connections between these counties over Old Tampa Bay. The purpose of the project was to remove and replace the existing four lane northbound bridge due to structural deficiencies and provide a new bridge with additional capacity. The new bridge will be constructed to the west of the existing southbound bridge and will provide four 12 foot general use lanes and four tolled express lanes two 12 foot lanes in either direction for additional capacity. The bridge will also include one 12 foot shared use path. Construction methods with the potential to e impact EFH include demolition, in water work and barge utilization. This work occurs over and within Old Tampa Bay, which is designated as an outstanding Florida water. During the ETDM phase of pd &E, NIMS conducted a GIS analysis and an on-site field inspection. NIMS commented that EFH, including mangroves and submerged aquatic vegetation in the form of seagrass, is present in the project area. Based on the presence of EFH, NIMS noted that EFH consultation, including an EFH assessment and benthic resource surveys during the science-based seagrass growing season of June to September, would be required. NIMS also recommended ESA Section 7 consultation and coordination on both EFH and ESA were handled together for this project. Benthic surveys were completed during the 2011, 2013, and 2016 seagrass growing seasons. These field reviews confirmed mangroves and seagrass, including shoal grass, turtle grass, and manatee grass in the project area. Continuous seagrass was observed along the shallow plateau that extended from the embankment to approximately 100 to 150 feet out. The water in this area was only around 5 to 10 feet deep, which provides good conditions for seagrass growth. The observed seagrass was less dense along the embankments of the causeway, likely due to wave action, which makes it difficult for seagrass to establish. Based on information from the project NRE, the EFH types identified within the project area provide habitat for species within the following fishery management plans. EFH, such as mangroves, seagrass, and the estuarine water column provides habitat that supports important life cycle stages, including post-larval, juvenile, subadult, and adult for a variety of species included in these fishery management plans. 
species within these fishery management plans that could utilize EFH types identified within the project area include red drum, neat shrimp, spiny lobster, coastal migratory pelagic fish, including mackerel, and snapper and grouper species. It should be noted that although red drum was federally managed at the time of the EFH assessment for this project, the species is no longer federally managed, so NIMS no longer considers its life stages when determining which species are supported by EFH in a project area. Based on the scope of work, no impacts are anticipated to the mangroves in the project area. However, temporary water quality degradation, such as turbidity, may occur due to demolition of the current bridge, as well as the construction of new pilings required to expand the causeway. Overall, no net loss caused by displacement is anticipated. Based on the project footprint and locations of seagrass mapped in 2016, nine and a half acres of impacts to this EFH resource are anticipated. In order to minimize impacts, DOT will adhere to a variety of avoidance and minimization techniques. The first step to avoid impacts was choosing an alignment that would decrease construction complexity and time. During construction, the seagrass or areas that are not anticipated to be directly impacted by the project will be delineated utilizing buoys, barriers, or other methods to alert contractors of these sensitive areas and avoid potential impacts from barge staging or sputting. Furthermore, best management practices such as phased construction, turbidity barriers, and silt fences will be utilized to avoid water quality issues with Old Tampa Bay, which is an outstanding Florida water as mentioned previously. DOT plans to utilize credits from the Old Tampa Bay Water Quality Improvement Project to mitigate unavoidable seagrass impacts associated with the project. The Old Tampa Bay Water Quality Improvement Project is an innovative mitigation project located at the Courtney Campbell Causeway. A portion of the causeway was converted to a low-level bridge to create a tidal connection in the northern portion of Old Tampa Bay, which has resulted in decreased water stagnation, which led to increased tidal flushing, stabilized salinity, and lowered dissolved nitrogen levels. The increase in water quality has created a first-of-its-kind water quality credit bank for stormwater management that can be used for future FDOT projects that drain into the bay. Along with water quality improvements, natural seagrass recruitment in the area has also established a seagrass mitigation site reserved for future DOT mitigation needs. As mentioned, DOT proposed utilizing the old Tampa Bay Water Quality Improvement Project as mitigation for seagrass impacts associated with the Howard Franklin Bridge Project. This mitigation plan was contingent on the success of the site. To date, approximately 20% of the available mitigation credits have been released for use as water quality has been restored in the area. The remaining credits will be released in the near future as marine sea grasses continue to establish. The success of this project has also led DOT to acknowledge similar mitigation strategies as a best practice when feasible. One of the major challenges faced during the PD&E process was the number of design changes. Over a four-year period, four major design changes occurred. These design changes consisted of two changes to the proposed bridge location, and then two separate changes to the bridge typical section that resulted in additional widening. These changes in the recommended alternative led to increases in seagrass impacts each time and required multiple reinitiations of EFH consultation with NIMPS. Another challenge faced, although not unique to this project, is the interconnectivity of project-associated seagrass impacts, and EFH coordination, and the permitting process. Accurate seagrass impacts are required for permits, such as the Core 404 permit and Southwest Florida Water Management District ERP permit, which are required, acquired after NIMPS consultation but before con construction. As seagrass coverage changes over time in Old Tampa Bay, sometimes drastically, DOT committed to conducting, conducting benthic surveys prior to construction. These surveys are necessary to support permit submittal and approval. During the PD&E process, NIMS also requested consultation for species and habitat protected by Section 7 of the ESA under NIMS jurisdiction. These species include small-toothed sawfish and swimming sea turtles. A may effect not likely to adversely affect species determination was made for all species. DOT also made commitments regarding construction methodology such as only conducting in-water pile driving activities during the day, as well as using pile driving ramp up procedures consisting of initial operation at low power levels with a gradual increase to the minimum levels required for pile installation. 
From start to finish, coordination with NIMS regarding EFH and ESA took five years. During this time, coordination with NIMS was reinitiated to discuss project changes and provide updates on seagrass impacts associated with those changes. Final concurrence was received on January 18th, 2018. In summary, initiating early ongoing coordination is important as it provides sufficient time to coordinate project changes and provides ample time for agency review and guidance. NIMS understands that project details change all the time, so keep in mind that the most important thing is to keep communicating throughout project development, design, and permitting to ensure that NIMS is kept in the loop regarding any project updates or changes as needed. Although EFH coordination for the project is complete, Seagrass surveys are also required to support and finalize the permitting process. Reinitiation may be required based on changes to seagrass impacts and finalization of construction methods. One final takeaway from this project is that DOT's innovative approach to restoration at Courtney Campbell Causeway has created a new approach to handling water quality and seagrass impacts and has created a viable mitigation bank for future DOT use. This type of innovative thinking when developing mitigation plans has the potential to benefit not only the project, but also future projects and management practices. And with that, I'd like to see if uh, David Rydeen has any additional thoughts that he would like to share regarding this project. Yeah, so um, one thing, I don't know whether this was mentioned before I lost my audio connection for a minute, but um, there was red drum on one of those slides. Uh, I just will tell you that, Red drum is no, no longer considered an EFH species because management has been shifted from the feds to the states now. So you won't have to consider that under EFH anymore. Um, in regards to this project, it was a there was a lot of moving parts on this project. So it was kind of challenging at, at times in terms of the design changes um, and things like that. They decided they needed to put up a temporary pier to load and offload barges and things like that. So that was something that came later. It, there was a lot of different changes, let's say. Um, on the ESA side, there was some challenges because in order to get the bridge, new bridge built in a timely manner, um, they wanted to do multiple pile driving operations. And so each one of those operations has a zone around it that could impact uh, threatened and endangered species. So we had to kind of work that out so that they would be spaced out in a way that there would be low noise zones in between them so that animals could get in and out of the bay if they wanted to. Um, so that was another challenge there. Uh, overall, you know, we, we're never happy when we lose a bunch of seagrass, but in this case, the project that they came up with is compensatory mitigation. I feel like, you know, we took lemons and we made lemonade because we consider the, uh, the project, the breaching of the Courtney Campbell Causeway, uh, where it was put is a good thing for, um, that northeastern part of the bay, which had known water quality problems and um, a shift in seagrass communities as you get further east towards the Tampa side, where it had turned more freshwater type, low salinity seagrasses rather than the typical uh, salt seagrasses that had been there historically. So um, while we lost some seagrass, I think we're overall, it's gonna be a, a benefit to the Tampa Bay system. So, yeah, I think that's about it. Great, thank you, Joy and Dave. Um, Joy, um, what was the biggest challenge you had with that, the project and how did you address it? Thank you, David. I think that probably the biggest challenge for this project was just the sheer number of design changes that were mentioned. And it was not only design changes, but design changes over a relatively short period of time. Um, and so the fact that there was uh, some uncertainty about where the proposed bridge was ultimately going to be relocated. So of course, then you have changes in the location of seagrasses uh, and seagrass impacts. And then the fact that the typical section was widened twice. So each time then more seagrass impacts were anticipated. So that was definitely a challenge. And each time, as I mentioned, consultation was reinitiated with NIMS. So I think that the best thing to do in these situations, I know that uh, David Rydeen has also mentioned this, is just that 
we really need to try and keep NIMS in the loop regarding any changes as soon as we know about them so that then they are continuing to give feedback regarding what is needed on the NIMS side and then DOT can reinitiate consultation if that is needed as soon as possible and hopefully limit any impacts to the schedule. Great, thank you. Well, at this time, I would like to uh, discuss minor project considerations. We've discussed uh, three major projects, um, but what about those minor projects? What, what do you need to consider? Um, are, here are, are a few thoughts to, to keep in mind for, for minor projects. Uh, coordination is still required for federal projects or projects requiring a federal permit that may involve EFH and ESA. Projects with federal funds or on the interstate system will have FDOT as the lead. State funded projects will have either the Army Corps of Engineers or the Coast Guard as the lead. Minor projects do not have a planning phase, therefore they go directly into the design phase. Minor projects can have abbreviated or inflexible schedules. Um, safety and maintenance repair projects, sometimes called push button projects, often start off with the assumption of no impacts. However, this, this needs to be confirmed. To determine the level of evaluation needed, check the environmental screening tool, use the National Marine Fisheries EFH mapper, uh, review the fishery management plan and regional fishery management council information to develop a managed species list and determine potential impacts. Typically, FDOT does not control what mechanisms the contractor will choose to use, so it can be a challenge to get to the level of detail needed for EFH consultations. The NRE is completed prior to permit applications being prepared and EFH concurrence is received prior to permit applications when FDOT is the lead. For projects when the Army Corps is the lead, the Army Corps will consult with NIMS. The environmental liaison should notify the project manager that once the NRE has been sent, any changes in design may result in having to reconsult. Overall, the level of detail provided in EFH assessments should be commensurate with anticipated impact of the proposed action. So at, at this time, uh, I'd like to uh, go back over those 10 EFH activities. As mentioned earlier, we have worked to weave into this presentation these 10 key EFH activities. We've discussed technical assistance as a means to seek guidance from NIMS. We've examined how the three case examples perform detailed assessments to determine the level of EFH impacts. We discussed what each of the projects included in their consultation pack packages with the objective of acquiring a federal permit. We've reviewed the timeframes that occurred with each of the projects. Dave reviewed and we saw project examples of the differences between EFH and ESA consultations. We have heard discussions on mitigation strategies and included an innovative example on the West Coast. We learned about the conservation recommendations for the projects and we have discussed how modifications to projects later in design and after coordination may require re-consultation with NIMS. I'd like to move to our EFH overview where our speakers can discuss these or other important EFH activities. Maybe Jen can, can start us off with her thoughts on this. Hi, thank you, David. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, FDOT for putting together this really great webinar. I'm actually learning as, as much um, as, as everybody else on the phone or on the uh, webinar is, I think. Um, so 
you know, my, my comments would just be, you know, we're so blessed to have this um, kind of uh, dedicated relationship with our agency counterparts um, to be able to give the time and uh, consideration to, to these projects. Um, and so we are able to work with the applicants to make sure that the EFH consultation package is complete um, and that we have had a chance to look at different avoidance and minimization op opportunities um, and then come up with a compensatory mitigation strategy that makes the most sense for the, for the project. Um, and so I think these three case studies give a great example of that and um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a great working relationship. So. Um, yeah, I think I think I'll just end there. Dave, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I'm going to clarify one thing that I forgot to mention before. Uh, as far as the difference between EFH and ESA, so EFH species are species that are caught and harvested still. So the focus there is to maintain the productivity of those fisheries, so they can continue to be harvested because that's an econ economic benefit um, to the state of Florida and to the nation as a whole. Um, NIMS and, and NOAA are actually part of the Department of Commerce, strangely enough, but so so the economic focus is, is there with EFH. Of course, you're not gonna harvest EFA species because they're in a world of hurt, but um, the, so the focus there is to get them to recover so they can be taken off the list. Um, so I just wanna make that point. Um, as far as, as the coordination goes, you know, like I said, we're always here from the outset of the project to the end of it, basically, when ready to be built. So please come to us with questions. There's no stupid questions. Um, we don't always have the answer right off the bat, but we can coordinate with our other staff at, at NIMS and, and find out an answer for you sometimes. So um, yeah, I mean, just come to talk to us whenever you need to. And we're there to help. And I think that's about it. Andy, do you want to go next? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I want to thank you for attending this webinar and also thank all the presenters for providing some really great case studies and information regarding EFH um, that I think is very useful for design and permitting of future projects. Um, I do want to reiterate uh, that while Dave and Jen wear the two hats in their transportation liaison roles, there is a difference between EFH and ESA, and impacts must be reviewed separately under the Magnuson Stevens Act and the Endangered Species Act. Uh, therefore, when FDOT is serving as the lead agency, please ensure consultations address both EFH and ESA. Um, also, I'd like to stress the importance of determining, determining the lead agency early based on federal or interstate funding. In this case, FDOT is the lead, um, and then versus state funding, where we or the Coast Guard are generally going to be the lead. Um, and for minor projects, including that information with the permit application is helpful, just so we know who has the ball. Um, also, uh, just Quick reminder that per the 1973 MOA with the U.S. Coast Guard that the Corps has, uh, bridge structures are regulated by the Coast Guard, um, and we get involved in permitting if there's a discharge of fill associated with the project, um, and that's such as uh, riprap or approach fill, or if we've got a non-bridge structure such as a temporary work trestle uh, proposed for the project. Um, therefore, for projects with only bridge impacts to EFH, you'll primarily be working with NIMS and the Coast Guard. Um, finally, just to reiterate again, um, stress, I'm stressing uh, early and often communication with both us and NIMS. Um, ETDM now provides a, a great platform for early communication of issues. Um, and then also, uh, we've got core funded project managers that have standing weekly and bi-weekly huddle calls with FDOT district coordinators. Those, those are great opportunities. We can invite Jen or Dave, um, you know, to talk about EFH for, for when, when that's applicable. Um, so we've got some, some good communication platforms set up. Um, and then one final note, um, and this is on compensatory mitigation. Um, for EFH, mitigation banks are, are 
in general a little bit limited on EFH credits, uh, especially when you're talking about seagrass or SAV credits. Um, therefore, FDOT, as we saw in the case studies, um, they're, they need to develop permittee responsible mitigation projects. Um, in coordinating with EPA, ideally, you, when you develop one of these projects, they're exclusively tied to an impact project. Um, one note is that if you do want to do an advanced permittee responsible mitigation project where you may use it in the future for multiple projects, those future projects need to be identified uh, in advance. Um, that's a big sticking point for EPA. So um, they need to be um, basically demonstrated during the, the, the mitigation permitting process to be appropriate for the future projects. Um, so that's uh, that's what I've got for you. Um, I guess at, at this point, we'll, we'll start taking some questions and hopefully provide some answers. Thanks again. Thank you, Andy. Um, Katasha, do you have any comments you'd like to, to make? Oh, sorry. Sure. Katasha. Yeah, I just wanted to echo a couple things that have been said. I just wanted to first echo what Jen said about, you know, really great working relationships and I appreciate everyone um you know um on the panel today and i think that it you know extends beyond just dot right i think as dave mentioned at the beginning you know there's a good working relationship with the um dot staff and the consultant community as a whole as well and so i think that just goes a really long way and like andy said our etdm is really that starting point to you know start that early and often communication and again i i don't think we can stress that enough i think there's a few um, comments coming in through the questions as well, kind of reiterating the making sure we're identifying that EFH um, as resources up front when we're in, in the ETDM process and just, you know, trying to do a thorough job at that while we're while we're at that early phase. So there is that opportunity to start thinking about those resources and how we might need to address them, especially like you saw on some of these more complex projects that could take quite a long time to get through the process just because there are so many moving parts and some unknowns at the very early stages of the process. Um, and then I also just think it's really important from an OEM DOT perspective to be really mindful about how we're documenting these, um, uh, you know, both both EFH and ESA consultation processes in our NEPA document or even in our state environmental um, impact reports, because if, as we've talked about a little bit, the Army Corps has to issue a permit as a lead or the Coast Guard has to issue a permit as a lead, getting a lot of that information documented early and that environmental document is really going to help them out as they're taking over the project and kind of going through that final consultation process with National Marine Fisheries as well. So it's just really, really important to make sure your documentation is clear. And I think Joy stressed that a lot in some of her discussions as well as Nicole. Um, but, you know, just making sure that you're keeping those two resources separate when you're documenting them. And then again, in your reevaluations, as you're going back through and having to maybe reinitiate consultation, just be really clear about you know what's been done what's changed and where you are within that process so as we're moving through the reevaluation stages and getting to that construction we can clearly document that everything's um, been completed and so um, that kind of leads me also to just briefly mention commitments i think it was touched on a couple times um, but it's really important to make sure that you know as we're going through again whether it's the nepa side or the pdne phase and we have commitments to come back and reinitiate or to provide additional information or to provide whatever the mitigation strategy is, to be very clear about those commitments and making sure that we're documenting how we're following through on those in the reevaluation phase. And our policies and procedures are pretty clear about that, but it's just a good reminder to make sure everyone's aware that that's something that we do so that not only the agencies know that we're gonna come back and meet those commitments and what they are and where we are within the phase of making those commitments happen, but also so the public can be aware of what it is that we're doing to um, address those resources. Thanks, David. Great, thank you, Katasha. Uh, at this time, we'll go into the question and answer phase. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel. I see that we are getting a, a few questions. So let me pull some up. Okay, so um, 
let's see, a question from Catherine. ESH involvement consultation with non-federal projects. Can you provide some examples of consultation for non-federally funded projects? Who would like to take that one? I can take that one. Um, so basically for a non-federally funded project, the Corps is gonna act as the lead if, if we're involved or, or the US Coast Guard. Um, and in that case, um, we would look to DOT to provide supporting documentation for the consultation that we would engage with NIMS. Um, and that could be a biological assessment or um, you know, other supporting documentation. Okay. Can the core provide mitigation examples for successful EFH mitigation? I, I believe we some of our case studies are are good examples that we went through in the presentation. I agree. Okay. Are there any permit exemptions for projects that minimize the amount of impervious within stormwater systems that discharge to impaired waters? I'll take that one too. Um, not, uh, not for federal uh, permitting. Um, DEP or Water Management District might have some exemptions that address uh, you know, minimization and avoidance uh, for specifically to stormwater discharges. Uh, for us, um, you know, the, the benefit for minimization and avoidance would be that you may qualify under a nationwide permit or a general permit um, that would reduce some of uh, some of your permitting time. Um, but we don't have any uh, exemptions that would address that from a federal perspective. Okay. What factors does NIMPS weigh the most heavily when determining the level of information that they need for consultations? Are, are all projects equal? Okay, I'll, I'll do that one, I guess. Um, well, now I would say all projects are equal because some projects obviously have very little involvement with our resources. You know, if they're widening a road in Immokalee, I'm not going to ask for too much because it's inland and it's there's no EFH and there's no ESA species. Um, you know, the bigger the project gets, the more complicated it is and the more involvement it has with our resources, you know, then that's going to require more coordination and more information. So now projects are not all equal. I mean, some projects we, and this is part of ETDM, um, you know, if we look at a project, we can tell them, no, you don't need to do uh, an EFH assessment because there's no reason to do it. Um, so there, yeah, it depends on the nature of the project, where it's located, how much it's going to affect our resources and how, how complicated the whole thing is. And I would just add, um, so, you know, there are even like bare sand substrate is considered EFH for things like, like white shrimp, but um, it's not, it's not kind of a, a rare feature. And so our mitigation requirements for habitats like that are generally not as significant as something like a seagrass meadow or, or fringing mangrove um, uh, areas. So, you, you know, we, not not all EFH, I think, are kind of created equal, um, nor are all impacts created equal as you can have kind of temporary or secondary impacts versus direct impacts. So, um, you know, there's there's a calculus that's involved there and we use um, we use the uh, like the UMAM process to kind of figure that out. Um, but yeah, there, you know, the, the as far as the level of information that's required, I mean, it's it's mostly pretty standard. I mean, you want to be able to identify the types of EFH that are going to be impacted by the project and then quantify those impacts um, using a tool such as, you know, UMAM, um, and then and then also quantify kind of how you plan to mitigate or off, you know, uh, compensate for the loss of that of that EFH. So um, so yeah, there's there's pretty standard information that's required in that in that case, but the 
level of information, you know, something like the First Coast Expressway, where we're really getting into the weeds on, you know, the, the edges of, of kind of tidal influence of, of rivers is different from something that's more straightforward, you know, like a like a small bridge with a with a very well defined kind of you know mangrove fringing mangrove impact or something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's for Natasha. Since ESA and EFH consultation was completed after the NEPA doc was approved, how was EFH and ESA addressed in the EIS? Isn't consultation supposed to be completed during the NEPA phase? Yeah, I think um, you'll see, and I think Dave actually alluded to this a little bit during um, his discussion, but I think you'll find that sometimes um, there's just not enough information to be able to complete the consultation during the NEPA process. And so what we do is um, we work really closely with the agency to be able to um, give them as much information as we possibly can up front with the expectation, our, our, whole, our goal would be to complete consultation for NEPA, if at all possible. But there's going to be times where that's just not possible, especially, you know, when we're talking about um, you know, bridge construction, there's just some unknowns. And I think you saw a lot of that in these examples um, where there's just the information is too detailed. Maybe we need a lot more um, field work to be done or whatever. And so um, we do work really closely again with the agencies to give them the information we can during the NEPA process, document what we, where we've gotten through to the consultation, you know, up to that point. And we agree together that, you know, look, we can't provide it now, but we can do it in design. And that's really where those commitments come in that I was talking about. Um, we can commit to um, can providing that information in more detail later on during the design process and finishing that consultation at that point in time. So we do um, disclose as much as we possibly can about the project and the impacts for the NEPA document, document where we are in the process, commit to reinitiating consultation in the future, and then that's our process to make sure that everyone's aware of where we are. Thanks, David. Great, thank you. Okay, the next one I have is how will NIMSH handle consultation with DEP uh, with the new 404 assumption um, projects? Uh, I guess I'll do this one. I'm, I'm not expecting any significant changes in the process. It's just who we're communicating with. Um, so so far, I mean it, that has just happened. So I don't. I guess I don't really know for sure. But I, I'm not anticipating any big changes really. And, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is I think most tidal waters are exempted from that. So I think it's it kind of goes through the normal channels, regardless of the 404 assumption. Yes, that's correct. Um, the vast majority of these uh, these projects are, that have EFH impacts will be in in retained waters. Um, so probably not going to be a huge issue. Knock on wood. <laughs> okay. Uh, for non-federal projects, which is exempt from the Army Corps and Coast Guard permitting, such as bridge pile stabilization, is EFH mitigation still needed? And if so, how would NIMS, tip, NIMS typically do this. Oh, I can try to take that. So, um, so the first question is, of course, is there a federal nexus, right? So, is the project authorized, funded, or carried out with with a federal agency? And so, if, if that's not the case, if the answer to all of those questions is no, um, we do not require an EFH or an ESA consultation on the project. Um, if there is a federal nexus, though, a lot of kind of these small scale kind of bridge stabilization or repair projects can um, generally be authorized under a nationwide permit. Um, and if if there if that's not possible, then um, then yeah, then we would we would step in and, and do a consultation on those projects. Um, but but general general repair and maintenance projects, I believe, are almost always carried out under a nationwide permit, which which doesn't require a consultation per se. But generally, we are given an opportunity to comment uh, on the pre-construction notification just to make sure that the project is aligned with kind of the best practices that NIMS would want to see in the project design. And, and we've had uh, several of these recently, some of these scour countermeasure uh, projects. And 
for those projects, none of them uh, required mitigation, uh, and primarily because you know the bridge is, is scoured out, so most of the, the valuable resources are not there, not present. So we're still um, you know checking the box for ESA and EFH, but um, none of those have required mitigation. And Andy, thank you for bringing up the ESA. So I think under under the nationwide permit project, I think that covers the EFH kind of consultation requirements. But sometimes those projects do require an ESA Section 7 consultation because they're really, there is an op opportunity to kind of impact or harm uh, endangered species. And so I think we generally do go through an ESA consultation process, even sure. if the activity is covered under a nationwide permit. Yeah, and some of that minor work is actually covered under JAXPO, the biological opinion that we did with the core um, for minor in water activities. So you have to look at JAXPO and may, it, cause it could very likely be covered by JAXPO in case, in which case it's the, basically the consultation's already been done. Yeah, and we're, we're actually in early discussions to potentially add um, activities like those scour, scour countermeasure projects because they don't quite fit JAXPO, um, but uh, you know, similar minor projects. Great, thank you. Uh, next question I have. So if I have identified unavoidable EFH impacts on my project, what does NIMS recommend to do to begin to determine my EFH mitigation options? Well, I mean, usually now the strategy has been if there's private mitigation banks available, I mean, once you've quantified what and qualified what the impacts are going to be. Um, if there's a mitigation bank and the project's in the service area, they go with the private banks first. Um, after that, you may go to Inlu Fee or, or one of the water management district uh, banks and go that route. And then, you know, at that point, if there's neither one of those work, then you got to go to permittee responsible. Um, so, but, you know, if we have a brilliant idea as far as what to do, we'll tell you, but sometimes um, it's up, really up to FDOT to figure out how they want to proceed and uh, propose that to us and get our feedback. Okay. Um, please you tell where to find information about HAPS, H-A-P-C-S, other than the EFH Habitat Mapper tool. So if you look up the websites for whatever fishery management council you're dealing with, whether it's the Gulf or the South Atlantic, they would have information about the H-A-P-C's on their website. Okay, thank you. What resources do you recommend uh, folks use? Um, maybe uh, provide some information on the EFH mapper or, or other types of tools that may be helpful for folks? Well, I know on the Gulf side, our Galveston uh, lab has actually developed a new EFH mapper um, that will show you the inland extent, how far up a waterway you would go and still consider EFH. Um, and I, I don't know, I'd have to I'd have to find the link, but um, there that that is available now, I think, to the public. I believe it's been released at least. And I, I find that um, that our, our agency partners, I mean, the, the EFH is designated based on the fishery management plans, um, but it's really, you know, instead of focusing on the managed species, focusing on the habitat type is, is generally a good way to go. 
Um, the habitat mapper is a good place to start because it does give you kind of broad scale patterns of, of essential fish habitat. But what you're really looking for as far as kind of concern goes, I mean, it's really it's seagrass, it's mangroves, it's salt marsh, it's hard bottom and coral habitat are your, your main habitat types of concern. Um, I hope I haven't left any kind of critical ones out. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard because those, those habitats are patchy. Um, and they're, you know, they, they're, they're hard to map on a very large scale. Um, but there are like, uh, FDEP has some really good like seagrass mapping layers. Um, I, I know NOAA has some good coral reef and hard bottom mapping layers. So there, there are some other resources out there. Um, and it, it would be nice if they were all kind of in, in one place, but I think that's, that's for the future. But um, Dave and I both have a pretty good sense of kind of what is out there where. So again, feel free to reach out to us and we can help steer you in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Can you give an example of cases where technical assistance can be used? Um, so I can I can start with this one. Um, so um, we you know we talked about kind of the disconnect between you know kind of the need to consult and when the NEPA documents are ready and kind of what is included in the NEPA documents. So um, we've run into that that problem a few times. And what we've done is if if the information isn't available for consultation, technical assistance is kind of a good um, kind of bridge, no pun intended, to kind of demonstrate collaboration with the agencies, that the agencies are aware of kind of where this project is, is going in the future um, and that there are those kind of touch points. Um, and so it's been a nice tool to just kind of document for the project file that, um, you know, in this case, FDOT has been in, 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 uh, in, uh, in touch and in communication with the agencies and that we're aware of the project and we're trying to address um, any major concerns or fatal flaws before the project gets too far down the road as far as uh, planning and design go. Thank you, Jen. Can you provide more guidance on when coordination is required versus reinitiation of consultation? Like highlight the differences between those, what triggers those different uh, activities. Well, I think it, it's mostly a, a matter of how big a change you're talking about, you know, whether, and this could be EFH or ESA, I guess, you know, how much, if, if things change, do they change very little? So it's not really a significant effect uh, uh, as far as the change goes, or is it a fairly substantial change where we really need to go back and look at things again and try to figure out what needs to be done um, to offset the impacts or or maybe if it's ESA you got to reinitiate the consultation and uh, look at the whole project again and and make sure that there's not a, a substantial issue so it's it's really just a I mean that's the same thing you know you just have to come to us and talk to us about it and figure out which route you need to do, you need to go there. Great, thank you. In what ways would, or what, what ways could uh, I expedite my consultation review? What activities um, would help me move through the process faster? Um, for the for the EFH process, I think we've got a really good track record of being able to turn those around um, in 30 days, which is kind of our statutory deadline. Um, things that help move things along quicker is a complete consultation package, I would say, and early coordination with the agency. If we kind of know what to expect and what's coming, um, and you know, kind of decision making is documented along the way, um, it definitely streamlines the process. So on that, that's what I can say for the EFH side. Um, I know that question comes up a lot more with the ESA side. Um, and, and the best thing, again, early and often communication, uh, a very complete consultation package with all of the relevant information definitely helps. Um, because Dave and I are part of this ETAP program, uh, we are able to give priority to FDOT projects. Um, if, if that 
if that program weren't in place, those consultations would be um, would be written in the order that they kind of arrive to the division or to the branches. Um, and they kind of get put on the bottom of a, of a fairly large pile. We have an extremely busy um, ESA Section 7 division. Um, and, and the consultation workload is, is very high and the staffing levels are very low. Um, and then once those consultations are written, um, they, they tend to go through a review phase because of the regulatory requirements. Um, are, the, the regulatory burdens from the ESA perspective are, are higher than for essential fish habitat. So for a letter of concurrence, which is an informal ESA consultation, there's a, a two-tier um, you know, review at our headquarters level. And for biological opinions, there's a three-tier review, and that includes a general counsel review. So um, those steps take time. Again, you know, you're you're kind of we have no control. D Dave and I have no control over the prioritization of that review. That happens in the order that they're received. So um, so that can be a bit of a bottleneck to receiving your ESA Section 7 consultation. We do our best to expedite, especially when, when there's a specific need and, and you know, permitting deadlines are coming up, um, but we have a limited opportunity to influence that, that process. Yeah, the, I would add to that that when you um, are developing the natural resources evaluation, it's good to send the, us a draft of that so we can look at it and see if there's any missing pieces. And that way we can let you know what additional information we're looking for and see if it's available and then put that in the NRE so when it's finalized, um, we're really ready to roll. Great, thank you. Uh, next question I have is, um, we've talked about the, the 10, um efh activities um that have been highlighted throughout the project are there any of those that you think are not being used enough or could be used more the two that i kind of highlighted as being you know kind of the, the the issues that i see the most are you know and we've, we've said this a number of times, is, is having the complete kind of EFH consultation package and then, you know, developing a, a, a good mitigation strategy. Um, I would say, in my experience, probably 80% of the conservation recommendations that we write for um, EFH consultations are that the mitigation strategy has just either not been developed or isn't complete. Um, and we understand that that is a challenge in this in this region. Um, there's there's a paucity of um, established mitigation banks, especially for estuarine credits. Um, and so sometimes it takes time and creativity to kind of develop an appropriate mitigation strategy. So so I know that that can definitely be a challenge. But um, you know, Dave and I, you know, we we've talked about some of these novel techniques, and we're we're definitely open and willing to work with AFDOT at exploring. You know, kind of out of the box alternatives. We definitely have a preference for, you know, going through established mitigation banking instruments, you know, kind of followed by these uh, in lieu fee programs, uh, permitting responsible mitigation. But, um, but be because it is a challenge and you're trying to find something that's both within basin and in kind with, you know, kind of um, mitigating the same type of habitat that you are impacting with the project that can be challenging at times and we kind of develop some flexibilities and some some kind of out of the box techniques to kind of help move these projects forward when we can and maybe david i would just add to like um, talking about uh, having a complete package um you know it's it's always a good idea to work closely with the designers as well um you know it's one thing to get the plans from them and just kind of say hey here's our impacts but you know if you can kind of create a good working relationship with your designers as well and maybe even bring them into the conversations so they have a good understanding of what's going on um, and why these resources are, are critical maybe they can come up with some really innovative ways of um, you know providing us the project we're asking for but you know trying to reduce or minimize those impacts as much as possible so um, that probably is a pretty obvious thing but i think sometimes it's not always as collaborative as it could be and so really just making sure that they're um, part of the process i think could help a lot
Thank you. Is there a database or website where engineers can look at the available mitigation credits for future projects to use? Uh, we have a, it's called uh, Ribbits um, that is available for use. And I think there's a public facing um, website for that. The only thing that it doesn't reflect um, is uh, cr the credits that are reserved. Um, you know, you, you may have to dig a little deeper and, and actually contact the bank to find out exactly how many credits they have. But it's a good it's a good close estimate. And maybe, David, that might be something we could add to the resources um, before we send out that information. Yeah, it's a good idea. All right. Well, at this time, uh, I think we've answered all the, the the questions that have have come in. Um, I can move now to some resources that uh, folks could um, use as links. So why don't I pull that up? So there, on this slide, you'll see a number of links, um, including the, the pd &E manual uh, with the EFH chapter, which is chapter 17, uh, the permit handbook as a whole, um, the FDOT NIMS EFH overview um, site that, uh, actually it's a training that was done, uh, I think in 2016 that, that Dave did. Uh, so you can see that. Um, there's the um, Army Corps of Engineers source book. There's the, the Army Corps Programmatic Biological Opinion or the, the, the Jack's Bow. Also, there's the, the NOAA Fisheries Southeast, Southeast Regional Office Habitat Conservation Division link the Gulfs of Mexico um, Gulf State Marine Fisheries uh, Commission EFH site, um, EFA, EFH research and EFH maps, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation Management Act that all can be reviewed. And when we post this up on the OEM website, you can um, link directly to those sites. So with that, I'd like to, to thank uh, Jen, Dave, Andy, Katasha, as well as Joy and Nicole for your participation. I also wanna thank everyone for attending today's webinar. The, the recording of today's webinar will be posted on OEM's resources page for future reference. I want to give it now to Katasha for an opportunity for any closing remarks. Sure, David, thanks. Um, just really quick as I'm doing that, could you maybe go back to the first slide of the references? Someone in the audience just asked to see that really quick. Um, and uh, <laughs> thanks. Again, just want to reiterate the thanks to the panelists. I know it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to get together and try to get organized for these events, um, but it does seem like we had a lot of really great audience um, questions and participation, which is really, I think, meaningful. It's great to um, be able to have a partnership where three agencies can come together along with our consultant partners to really um, talk about these issues that we're all dealing with every day. And so um, your time and, and effort is really well appreciated. And thanks to the audience members as well for attending. Um, and we'll get this posted as soon as we can, probably early next week. And um, for those that attended, we'll you know make sure you get a copy of this as quickly as we can. And hope you have a really great day. And thanks again.